Welcome to the Day Zero Update for March 15th, 2015. I am Filippo Danolfo. I'm Patrick Mifflin. Uh, Brandon and Teresa are out this week, but it um, might pre be pretty fitting considering this is sort of the uh, uh, spring break unspecial. Finally, there's not a whole lot going on. <laughs> and <Yeah>. so <laughs> They're going to take a vacation. Kinda, this is probably a good week to do it. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, getting started, what have you been playing? Uh, the usual suspects, Defense Secret 2 and uh, uh, Dead or Alive 5 last round, uh, which is still, it's occupying a lot of my time, but uh, yeah, there's some technical problems still. Yeah, um, which is a shame because underneath that there's a great game and Team Ninja is working really hard to get everything up and running the way it should be, so. Yeah. Uh, the the really uh, weird part is that most of the technical problems are on the Xbox platforms and not on the PS yeah. and the Sony ones, so that's a bit annoying. But whatever, <laughs> we'll get yeah. it fixed. And of course, and, and of course, I bought the Xbox version just for um, for stick compatibility reasons, which is kind of biting me in the ass right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the last patch actually did fix a lot of stick compatibility problems. So, well, no, I um. The fact that um, the PS4 doesn't like my converter oh. <laughs> without having a physical interface to my computer is kind of annoying. Yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah. And beyond that, I've also been playing Axiom Verge, so I'm kind of enjoying still that. Still can't really talk about that very much. Yeah, I still can't really say much, so another, another couple of weeks I'll have the review done and then we'll be able to talk more about it. Cool. Mm. What about yourself? Well, uh, Ridge Racers 2 is still occupying a good deal of my time. I've got a few videos ready to um, to put up on YouTube, just some Pro Tour 720p stuff off of off of the PlayStation TV. Um, obviously, I've been playing Final Fantasy VIII. For those of you who've been following um, the Voice of Descent series, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thought it was a pretty good show this week, if I do say so myself. Yeah. Um, and I finally got around to starting Shovel Knight, and it's making me it's making me wonder what took me so long getting around to it in the first place, because <laughs> this it's like a celebration of so many games from the 80s and 90s that I loved, and almost the, I want to say it's like a love letter to the Turbo Duo, because just the, the way it looks, the way it plays, the way it sounds really just fits in with everything that that platform was about mm -hmm. back in the day. So yeah, I have yet to uh, play it, but uh, I expect that uh, once it comes out on the Xbox One, or then I'll pick it up. Yeah, I actually was going to make it the background video for this week, but then I realized I didn't have it on any consoles yet. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and I'm still not quite set up to do uh, PC capture. So yeah, you would have had to have it on, on either the PS4 or the or the Wii U. Yeah, um, I could have done that. Mm -hmm. I I want to take a closer look at my bank account before I do. <laughs> yeah, I but, totally um, understand that. But yeah, a fantastic game. If you haven't played it, d don't even hesitate. It's platforming at its absolute best. Yeah, yeah that's why it won a whole bunch of awards last year. <laughs> yeah, ga gaming needs more more of that uh, of that brand of gaming for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, what are, we can go from uh, what you have been playing to what you will be playing in a couple of days. Yeah, a uh, new release this week, um, coming Tuesday. Um, kind of joking about this on the show notes, I, I put the release as Final Fantasy XV demo, <laughs> but actually it's the release of Final Fantasy Type-0 HD, which um, a new trailer is out for it. Um, that's really making an effort to tie Type Zero to the series at large, and does a pretty good job of it. Yeah, it's uh, quite an interesting trailer. But what I what I found great about that trailer is it wasn't trying to be a movie trailer; it was trying to be a game trailer, and I think it succeeded quite handily at that. Yeah, we we definitely need more of that because um, gameplay trailers are so so much more informative about what really matters about a game than cinematic ones. Yeah. And that's a trap that Square Enix in particular has fallen into several times over the years. 
And so it's good that they put together something that really gives us a good indication of um, We're of what the game's going playing. to be yeah. playing. Yeah. What the game's actually going to play like. Um, but they, they made a lot of references in this tr- particular trailer to past games and uh, a couple of other things for that matter. Um, I'm guessing... It was Shiva in the trailer this time around. Seems to be plucked largely from the King of Fighters character Kula Diamond. <laughs> and I don't know what the hell Gilgamesh was doing, but it looked like he was about to uh, use Common Rider Wizard's uh, Flame Dragon Final Strike. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if he's got anything resembling a wizard driver, that's going to make that battle a real pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. This game, but I look forward to it. Um, Honestly, I I was more about the demo than than the game. Honestly, hmm. uh, up up until fairly recently, but uh, they're making Type Zero look really good, yeah. and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this became one of my next big gaming time sinks. Yeah. Well, Type Zero That's was I, always very good. It was just on yeah. the PSP, so most people never saw it. Yeah, and, and it never Japan. got the release over here. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, there was a fan translation that um, has sort of controversial finished among the the team themselves didn't really agree on how to roll it out. Yeah. But now we're getting an official release. Um, and it seems like, I mean, there's been some news elsewhere that the... The ending seems to imply that Final Fantasy Type 1 is finally coming. Hmm. And so it seems like... I would say that they're finally building a kind of Final Fantasy branch platform for uh, future action RPGs, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a couple years down the road, in hindsight, we think that uh, Final Fantasy 15 itself might have worked a lot better under that banner. Yeah, But um, it's good to know that um, type 1 is probably coming because Hajime Tabata is a great game developer, but it was uh, or with uh, with Yosuke Matsuda at the helm and wanting to return to turn the company to its roots, I, th- I think it was very unlikely that uh, Tabata was going to get the Final Fantasy 16 project. Mm-hmm. And so um, maybe we'll see the Final Fantasy type um, brand start to take root here yeah, could be very well I mean yeah. from what I'm seeing of it it looks excellent and if I had the money I'd be picking it up this week but you know, we'll have to wait a couple of weeks to get my hands on that yeah, yeah. It, it looks like the best thing that's been released with the Final Fantasy name in quite some time you know barring maybe um, some of the mobile stuff or 14 yeah which yeah. to some people might count and other people might not. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't think the MMO has really got much of a much of a following. Which is a shame because 14 is really good. Mm. Especially after that reboot. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, I have no experience with it before that. So. <laughs> mm. um, so moving on from that, um, sales numbers for February are in. Um probably the least surprising outcome we've had in quite some time 3ds wins yeah this is this is how this stuff goes nintendo releases the 3ds everybody buys it that's just how it works yeah it was um new hardware um majora's mask 3d and you know monster hunter 4 ultimate yeah the, everything there is a heavy hitter and when you pile them all up in the same month it's just i mean <laughs> Monster Hunter has been impossible to find it. I've looked yeah. <laughs> around locally trying to find a copy. I look, I saw Amazon. I think it's going for about twice what it's actually worth there. Yeah. And so um, hopefully, you know, I, I don't want to resort to buying it digitally for a few Nintendo-related reasons, but <laughs> um, at the same time, I might... You know, I'm I'm really hoping to play it sooner than later because it, everything about it looks great. Yeah. Did you have one of the new 3DSs? I do not. No. Um, I was holding out for the Monster Hunter edition because I thought, oh, everyone's going to be going after the um, 
the Zelda edition and um, Monster Hunter is going to be kind of off to the side of all that. No, <laughs> no, Monster Hunter has been just as attractive a purchase um, for people as uh, as Zelda has. So mm-hmm. I've been SOL, and besides, it probably wouldn't have been in- entirely smart for me to just randomly purchase a, a new 3DS XL yeah. at the moment. Mm-hmm. As it is. How many did they sell? Did they sell? Um, Quite a three few. DSs. Yeah. Or yeah, in February. I hold on a moment. <laughs> I'm kind of window juggling right now. Yeah. All right. So, um, it sold more than two hundred ninety thousand combined physical and digital units, and is now the fastest selling Monster Hunter Hunter title across all platforms in U.S. history. Hmm. Game has the highest meta score of any Monster Hunter title in U.S. history, and is also Capcom's fastest selling title on the 3DS. <laughs> so we're dealing with a little bit of a beast here. Oh, hey! <laughs> All right, looks like Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate is back down to forty dollars on Amazon. Yeah. That's tempting. Um, still overpriced as shit on the. Oh wait, that's. That's the import. I don't want the import. <laughs> oh, definitely overpriced as shit for the hardware. Yeah. Amazon themselves want five nineteen for it. Whoa. <laughs> Fuck that noise. <laughs> but I'm definitely gonna keep a window open for that standard edition because hell yes. Yeah. So yeah, three DS doing really well. Yeah, um, and it's funny because this is another system that for the first, um, I would say, good year and a half to two years of its um, market presence, uh, people were playing Doom and Gloom with it, just like they did for the original DS. Yeah. And now it's... Yeah, this seems to yeah. be kind of a trend with the Nintendo handhelds. Uh, they'll, release, they'll release it, uh, the journalists will you know, crap all over it, uh, then it'll, you know, start slowly burning, burning up, and uh, then the journalists have to acknowledge, uh, well, you know, maybe it wasn't such a huge because failure. Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't ever bet against a Nintendo handheld. <laughs> yeah. It is not safe money. <laughs> yeah. Nintendo consoles, on the other hand, haven't done so great. But well, at least the Wii U I hasn't. How the well, while I'm on this, I'm going to take a look and see if um, the standard new 3DS is hard to... Mm, I think those are actually pretty easy It's hard to, to find. Mm. Let's see. 3DS XL. New 3DS XL. Oh, they're, they're getting gouged. Yeah. The black one's two forty two ninety nine, and the red one's two thirty two. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to try them. GameStop. $50 price hike. And then you factor in the fa- you know, no charger. Yeah, so that's under 15 bucks you got a fed. Hmm. Uh, game systems. It's like, really? But yeah, I think I'm going to be ordering. Hmm. Oh, okay, good guy GameStop. Yeah. They're yeah. not doing that. They're not doing that $209.99. Uh, bullshit. They're just saying one ninety nine ninety nine for new three DS XL. Yeah. Um, in stock. Hmm. Yeah, if you want one, you just go over to GameStop. Yeah. I will have to visit that possibility. I'm really, really reluctant to make major purchases as things stand at the moment. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I might be able to make that happen. Yeah. Well, they're not going anywhere, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I hope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I got that figured out. <laughs> yeah. um, moving on, uh, PlayStation View coming sooner sooner than later if you live in select U.S. markets. Yeah. If you're in Chicago, Philadelphia, or New York, you'll be getting it in the next two weeks. If you're living anywhere else, uh, we don't know. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of surprising that the rollout's going to be this limited, but um, yeah. Well, this is the initial test the market, so uh, kind of yeah. expect that. Launch proper is going to 
still be this year by all accounts. Yeah. And so... Yeah, from what I've been reading and hearing about the, the service, it's a, you know, pretty nice, nicely put together package. Uh, what we don't know yeah. is pricing, so... <laughs> yeah. Um, it is missing some channels uh, that the dish picked up for uh, Sling TV. Yeah. Most notably, uh, probably ESPN. Yeah. But... And AMC is on there, too, so that's definitely going to be a factor for some people. Yeah. That's nice uh, that you have options, though. I mean, uh, yeah. Sling TV, you can watch it on Roku, you can watch it on Xbox One, and uh, on the web, and iOS, Android, and all that good stuff. Yeah. PlayStation View is going to be a little bit more limited. So. Yeah. Hmm. Although they do sound like they're uh, working to make it as widely usable as possible. Yeah. Um, it doesn't sound like it's going to be limited to PlayStation platforms for very long. Yeah. So mm. we'll see where that goes. But um, I'm definitely looking forward to this. Um, we need IPTV to take off. Yeah. And Based on the channel yeah. lineups, like what? Uh, which of the two services is more interesting to you? Um, hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. I know that View has more channels than Sling. I know View has local affiliates too, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it does. That makes a difference to me. Yeah. Um, well, I see that. Um, okay, there's the, there's the deciding factor for me. Hmm. Um, PlayStation View has NBC Sports. Okay. And so that's that's where all the hockey is at the moment. <clears throat> yeah. And so uh, NHL. I, it has to be, it has to be uh, PlayStation View for me. Okay. Because hmm. um, and hopefully, you know, sooner or later, one of the two services will pick up Altitude Sports and Entertainment because yeah. that's where the Colorado Avalanche games are all aired. Yeah. So. Yeah, some, some good news for cord yeah. cutters. So we'll uh, we'll follow that as uh, the story develops. Following up on the whole net neutrality thing from. Uh, a couple weeks ago, without <laughs> which none of this would be really likely to pan out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the rules were released for that, but yeah, they're 400 pages, so I'm not entirely sure yeah. it's the time to go through that. And anyway, I'm in Canada, so that doesn't really affect me all that much. Yeah. <laughs> we have our own crappy rules to contend with. <laughs> <laughs> so, um,. Next story is a uh, do-it-yourselfer has consoleized the Capcom CPS2 hardware, yep. which still features some of the best games of all time. And you know, the more hands this can get into, the better. Yeah, <clears throat> kind of a steep price if you're you know really looking at it as far as what you can get. But uh, yeah, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> it's a CPS2 board that you can plug into a television and play. So yep, <laughs> you know. And if you think the hardware is expensive, wait till you see the games. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them anyway. Some of the yeah. games are fairly cheap. Some of the better ones. Yeah, like Alpha Three. Yeah, have fun finding finding that for a reasonable price. Yeah. Uh, Super Turbo, even more so. <laughs> yeah. Mm. A couple like, of the a couple of the beat 'em ups also are pretty pricey. Yeah, mm. I, I I own a Super Turbo board, and it just about broke me getting it. So. <laughs> yeah, I. We're talking upwards of five hundred dollars. <throat> yeah. So. But yeah, um, the guy working on it says um, there's no JAMA connector yet, but that's something that'll be worked on for future versions. Hmm. Current hardware is four hundred dollars. Uh, it's kind of what you see is what you get, but the ability to uh, to consoleize the CPS2 will um, open up a lot of games for people that might not otherwise be able to experience them. Yeah. And yeah, right. It reminds me a little bit of the uh, of the CMVS that uh, came out a little few uh, few years ago, well, a couple of years ago actually. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, it's by uh, I can't remember the. It was Analog something, the name of the company that did it. 
the consoleized uh, Neo Geo MVS one slot. Interesting. Yeah, in a nice hardwood case, uh, HDMI out. Uh, it was very ni- very nicely done thing, but very yeah. expensive. <laughs> it was like seven hundred bucks. I was gonna say that um, if it's got stuff like HDMI out and things like you know more modern features, then I can see it being worth it, but. Uh, simply consoleizing the MVS hardware. That's not hard. Um, yeah, it's working. one of the easiest. Yeah. Like, get get hold of an AES system, and then it, isn't it like remove a pin or two or something like that? Yeah, pretty much. Like if you can find a, you can find a working AES, you know. Yeah. Hmm. But, hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I like um, when I see this kind of stuff because you know. Yeah. You know, preserving these kind of games and giving people the opportunity to play them on, you know at home you know, arcade perfect versions because they are the arcade versions so and people who, are, who aren't fundamentally lo- insane like me and just go out and buy the cabinets yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is always an option <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um so some of you might remember last week um in the middle of everything i noticed that square enix launched a a survey basically asking people what um, what they wanted to see from the company moving forward. And there was a lot of really um, promising language. The word chrono came up multiple times on their part. I mean, it, it, not just what, when they were asking it of me. Um, so uh, one thing that I kind of glossed over and didn't notice right away was that there was almost, I mean, there, there was zero mention of the PlayStation Vita throughout that survey, Yeah, which is bothering, bothersome because... It just reminds me a little too much of the whole EA washing its hands of the Dreamcast. Mm-hmm. Um, Square Enix and the PlayStation Vita have the same audience. Mm-hmm. And between the EA Dreamcast thing 15 years ago and now this, I almost have to wonder if there's some kind of stigma within the industry uh, attached to third parties helping platforms thrive. Hmm. Like, if that's somehow frowned upon among your contemporaries, if you're a third party and um, and a manufacturer might have you to thank for the, for the livelihood of their platform, if that's somehow a bad thing, hmm. because otherwise there is no logical explanation for this. Well, the only uh, thing that I could see, and I don't really attribute this to, you know, maliciousness on Square Enix's part, um, I'm kind of thinking that, that Square Enix right now is in kind of a rebuild phase. And, uh, yeah. I think maybe supporting the Vita, uh, as heavily as, you know, they do mobile will probably stretch the resources thinner than they would probably be feel comfortable with. Yeah. You know, that's the only logical explanation I could come up with. Uh, yeah. It's, it's just frustrating. Hmm. Um, seeing what a, what a great RPG platform the PlayStation Vita is, and then pretty much the company synonymous with it, not wanting to get involved. Yeah. You know, that that's just how I look at it. Yeah. It could also be something along the lines of Square Enix knows something we don't, whereas they're, they're probably not going to support the PlayStation Vita, but they're uh, all on board with whatever Sony's going to be coming up with next. Yeah. Uh, it could be that. Possibly, um, oh man. If it is, I'd like to hear what whatever's next entails because I don't know. I still have a lot of hope for that system. Hmm. You know, Vita is a very it's a great system. You know, especially if you pick up a Vita TV for like a hundred bucks and you got a very nice, <laughs> very nice little console there. Well, eighty now. Eight, yeah. If you got in. the, if you got a memory card for it, and yeah. Um, yeah. a controller, a spare DualShock Three or something kicking around. Yeah. Or if you don't, hundred bucks for the whole bundle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is fair. Yeah, I mean, the DualShock Three, you think of that as maybe forty dollars in and of itself, and then the memory card is twenty. Yeah. You're getting the system for um, for twenty or for forty bucks in that bundle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also heard that it will work with the DualShock 4, but I can't yep. confirm that. It does. Yeah. Six-axis, DualShock 3, DualShock 4. Hmm. It takes them all. Hmm. 
So that's handy. I mean, if you have a PS4, you don't even need to bother with uh, picking up the bundle. You just grab a memory card and yep. the console itself, and you're good to go. Yeah, and for those who have been watching the the Ridge Racer videos I've been uploading, I've, I've just been using an old 6 access for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a, a spare I had kicking around and needed a controller, so... Hey, it works. <laughs> plug, plugged it in, sure enough, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, some annoying news from Square Enix, but some less annoying news from what used to be Rare, now Platonic. Yeah, um... Project Ukulele has been, uh, kind of. I don't want to say revealed. it's been shown, <laughs> but uh, we know that it's a thing. We know what it is. It's a spiritual successor to Banjo Kazooie. Yeah. So, uh, 3D platformer fans rejoice. Yeah. Yeah, we had to um, mention this here because Brandon was all about this, so we, we couldn't. Not, yeah. Not cover this. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it, it's really nice. Definitely. To see this kind of game coming back. It really is. I mean, I, I've i never really been a part of that audience um, particularly, so I didn't realize um, what a lull the genre had sort of settled into since um, since I'm used to seeing, like, everything... Well, everything that Naughty Dog was cranking out and everything that Sony First Party in general was cranking out. Yeah. Um, I just didn't realize there was a problem. And so... <laughs> I, I looked at um, what's been going on recently, and obviously Knack failed miserably at um, getting things started again, and we'll see if we have better luck with Project Ukulele. Yeah. yeah. I haven't yet played Knack, and I'm, I'm, I'm morbidly curious. <laughs> I yeah, uh, I think it can be found in bargain bins pretty much everywhere now. Yeah. I'm surprised it hasn't been a giveaway game on PlayStation Plus yet. <laughs> oh. But, <laughs> I'm not sure that, that would actually meet the. Yeah, they don't want to feature for, that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'd probably give that out, but just like not mention it. It's true. Mm. Oh wow, they still want twenty-seven bucks on Amazon for it. Oof. No. <laughs> <laughs> just nope. no. Mm. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> oh. Mm. So. Mm. So. Shu VR had, news for this week. Yeah, Shu Yoshida had some some words. Yeah, um, it's kind of a um, a contrast to last week, where it was pretty made clear. It was made pretty clear that Sony was sparing no expense in R and D for Morpheus, which is probably the better long term plan, considering some of the things that can go wrong with VR if you. Um, Cut corners, penny pinch, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, now he's saying they're going to launch it as at, at the lowest price possible. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. You you met, you have to put that in the same frame as last week's news. And so I mean, I'm still hoping they can get it out there for three hundred dollars because I really think that's the magic number. Yeah, I think that's probably where it's going to end up settling. Uh, higher than that, it's going to be a very big ask, considering the PS4 is also the same price. So, you know, yeah, you get to you don't want to go to 400 and, yeah. and you definitely don't you want to do, do a price drop on the PS4 and then have Morpheus be even more expensive than the console you're playing it on. That that just yeah. won't work. So, yeah, I think 200 or 299 is probably going to be the magic number here. But, uh... Yeah, and then in... I w what I would hope is Captain Obvious news. Um, he said that uh, we were probably going to start to see some news about games at E3. Yeah. Um, I would not want to be him if they didn't have news about games at E3. <laughs> yeah, you've been working um, on it for more than a year and a half. You'd better have something. Yeah. To show. <laughs> so, um, it says it's still on on track for the first half of 2016. I would put the over under at E3 itself next year. Yeah, I can see it cutting that real close. Yeah, well, Sony is and, yeah, does tend to release uh, a lot of stuff like right before E3 or something like during the show sometimes, which has yeah. always been annoying for people who attend the show. 
Yeah. Mm. But so far, they've limited their releases at the show to um, to stuff people can afford in the, on the spot. The exception, of course, being the limited edition 20th anniversary PS4 yeah. that was at um, PlayStation Experience. Yeah. But, um, well, but yeah, this is something... Those didn't really sell for any more than a typical PS4 did. You just couldn't get yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, well... It, I'm saying that on, on the understanding that I doubt a, whole, a lot of people go to these shows with $400 kicking around for swag. Yeah, but, that's um, true. Like, uh, that that would be kind of running afoul of the Sega Saturn rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, if you're if you're gonna release something on the spot, release a game, release a peripheral. Yeah. Um, well, a peripheral that isn't going to be in the same uh, general pricing neighborhood as a system yeah. uh but yeah this is something that yoshida really believes in yeah so um i think the world is ready for vr at this point yeah um and it, that's important to note because i don't think it was at any point before yeah either uh the pricing what wouldn't have matched up to to consumer needs or um you know, you saw Nintendo really jump the gun back in the 90s, and that might have set things back even further. Yeah, I think that kind of made people gun-shy after the after the Virtual Boy. But, um, but I think um, if Nintendo hadn't cut so many pricing corners with it, the price would have been a non-starter, so... Yeah. Um, not to mention the whole frame rate issue and... Um, the fact people stumbling you, around drunk and projectile vomiting. We don't. We didn't need any of that either. Yeah, and the fact that you lose the ability to see red for several hours after playing it. So yeah, uh, that that was pleasant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you want to know what it's like to be colorblind, play the Virtual Boy for a few hours. <laughs> yeah. Um. And why the hell did they go with red? <laughs> like, <couldn't, laughs> like I, I'm sure that they could have used filters, something, anything that would have. Um, mitigated the scorch effect that was going on. Um, Searing directly. No, we're going to we're going to just go with um, just blinding, um, eye destroying red. (laughs) That's what we're going to sell our games with. (laughs) No. Ah, live and learn. So, but yeah, I do agree with you that the market's ready, the technology's ready. Um, 2016's the year. Yeah. And, and it's being delivered in a way that is non-threatening as well, if you, if you know what I mean. Like, people don't need to be worried that, um, the, the hardware manufacturers are going to try to turn VR into some kind of replacement for, um, for gaming on the TV. And we've talked about this on the show before, Yeah. but especially back around, um, 10 to 12 years ago, you had a lot of people who were trying to champion VR and said, this is going to replace everything. This is the solitary future that gaming has, and it has to go there. And, you know, that mentality would have completely torpedoed the technology. And, uh, now you're seeing, Companies approaching it from a realistic standpoint. Uh, they're not trying to replace gaming as we know it. It's just another another way to do this thing that we all love. Yeah. And and that sort of um, realistic approach to delivery is what's going to to make VR uh, the big phenomenon it's going to be. Yeah. No, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I want to see. Uh some of these retro compilations, uh, retro arcade compilations oh, and VR, where you're walking around the arcade, you've got you know, Journey blasting around, the, blasting around the, <laughs> the stereo system. Uh, and now we're going to we're going to have arcade compilations with licensed soundtracks. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's going to be crazy. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, the, there already is one. Uh, the Namco 50th anniversary had a licensed soundtrack. So nice. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. Uh, yeah, I want that. Let's uh, let's do some of that. <laughs> yes, hmm. especially I've seen some stuff going on like Steam, where uh, they're letting people build their own arcades out of games they own on Steam. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see that. Just 
explode with VR. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. There's so many things you could do in VR that would heighten the experience of playing, you know, traditional games. You don't have to replace them. You can just augment them. Yeah. You know? And at the same time, it wouldn't even really disable the ability to play those games the you know the old fashioned way, if you will. Yeah. Um, it's just another great way to experience them, and and I think that needs to be the spirit of VR. Yeah. yeah let's get some more VR. And I'm sure at E3 we're going to. See, oh yeah. I, I was just going to say I'm sure at E3 we're going to see some crazy uh, overreach stuff. I'm I'm going to call it now. Mm. By the way. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to see some irresponsible de development on the side of VR. I think Mirror's Edge 2 is going to be Morpheus compatible. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of... Yeah, I can agree with you on that. Probably will be. The, the, the timetables just line up too well. Uh, there... You know, there, there's going to be a lot of really impressive stuff on the trailer. They're going to want some franchises on board. I just get the feeling that Mirror's Edge 2 is destined for Morpheus, <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not quite as bad as weaponizing Sonic, but, you know, <laughs> it's almost bad. Uh, yeah, that's that's something the Oculus crowd's dealing with right now. Yeah. I forget, did you see the YouTube video of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So just no. They didn't even have, they didn't even add enemies or homing jumps or anything to that. I, <laughs> I want to see this in its finished form. Yeah. yeah. And falling off a ledge is just pure nightmare fuel. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah more VR news. Yeah. This stuff can't get here soon enough, but unfortunately, the Oculus isn't getting here this year, by the looks of it. On the consumer level. Yeah. Um, they say it's going well, but it's just not on track for a 2015 launch. Um, I don't think that's going to be a huge deal. It, it's been looking all along like 2016 is going to be the year, so yeah. Um, just piling all those releases up right around the time of E3, and um, you know, just the right around springtime. I think it's going to it's going to be a tremendous, um, not simultaneous rollout, but very close by, and then you're just going to see everything explode as you get closer to the holidays. You're going to see some of these other, um, these other companies, the the whole Valve HTC um, collaboration, um, yeah. Samsung, Oculus, uh, yeah, and, you know, Microsoft with their Hololens, which is well, not really, which is AR, not VR, but not the same thing. Not quite the same thing. Yeah, Although I had to can, kind of laugh. It can that. do immersive. Uh, Thing. You can it can completely blot out whatever's uh, in front of you. Yeah. So there's that. I, I just had to kind of laugh during their presentation at their Windows 10 presentation when they were saying, "Oculus, come make holograms with us." <laughs> uh, <laughs> that may be a bit much. <laughs> yeah, but again, yeah. Um, it does bring up a uh, does bring up the point of uh, VR fragmentation. Uh, well, we're yeah. going to have a lot of different hardware platforms, and I'm wondering if any of them are going to work together. Yeah, I, well, I think Oculus is going to be sort of the industry standard that the PC is going to have to lean toward. Yeah. And I think Project Morpheus is just going to kind of be its own thing. It's going to be a... a Sony standard. You know, if you want VR on PlayStation, you're using Morpheus. Yeah. And so, you know, it's going to be an expensive uh, way to do that, but... Hmm. I'm, I'm a believer now. I I think the content is going to be compelling enough that people are going to want to buy Project Morpheus to play uh, their PlayStation games in VR. Yeah. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> I I am looking forward to E3 like I have not looked forward to E3 in a long time. Yeah. And so. Yeah. No real good segue to this next um, story. <laughs> so, yeah, we were talking about Windows 10 a minute ago. Yeah. Yeah. So. We're going to be talking about VR a lot for the next several weeks. It's just probably for the next year or so. Yeah. So, just be ready for that. <laughs> yep. So, Xbox Live for Windows 10, not going to have a cover charge. So, 
this is a good thing. Uh, in, a, in a move that I would hope surprises nobody. No, should surprise <laughs> nobody on the PC. Apparently, it surprised the uh, Xbox One players to the point that they were complaining about it. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. I don't know what they expected. Online gaming on PC has been free uh, since the dawn of time. Hmm. Um, there was no way they were going to try and upset that. There's this little thing called precedent. Yeah. And I think um, if anyone in the Xbox division was feeling the least bit trollish, um, all they would have had to have done was link to a YouTube video or a YouTube video of um, Tool, uh, the song "Hooker with a Penis." <laughs> you know, um, yeah. There's a thing called precedent. Mm. Um, we came out with Xbox Live. Um, what was it 13 years ago now? Yep. Um, Online console gaming didn't really have a precedent for charging or non-charging, but we put Xbox Live out there with a subscription fee, and you guys paid for it. Yeah. So, thank yourselves. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, though, I think the days of paying for online gaming on consoles are going to be coming to an end very soon. Very soon, Probably this year. I'm actually going to make that claim. Mortal Kombat 10 seems to be implying that. Um <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how it works if um, if we're just going to be seeing them move to a model where um, the free games are such a such a draw that they can keep the online services afloat without making the subscriptions mandatory to keep the servers going. Yeah, it's obviously online console gaming works in a completely different environment as PC, where it's almost entirely user end on PC. Um, but consoles kind of rely on that cent that centralization, the um, that centralized networking and back end yeah. service. Yeah, but they don't have to. In you, if you could you could do a peer to peer server on consoles. I think Call of Duty actually some of the some of the Call of Duty games actually did do that, and that didn't work so well because of all the cheating that ended up happening on it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why that's why I like the centralized stuff, the mm -hmm. um, closed servers and what have you. Yeah. Um, it it guarantees a certain quality that I certainly haven't experienced playing games online on PC. Mm. There's, I, I like standardization like that, though. Yeah. Mm. Um. But yeah, it's one of those things I'm. I'm I'm surprised that anyone was surprised, and <laughs> but this is the internet. People will complain about everything. Yeah, hmm. and the news itself, I think, is just kind of nothing changes, and the world will continue to turn. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. there are some pretty good changes coming to PS4 pretty soon, though. Yes, yeah. this is actually uh, kind of important. I mean, they've announced uh, PS4 firmware 2.50. With uh, quite a few accessibility functions. Uh, they're doing text-to-speech, uh, the ability to invert colors. I'm not entirely sure if that's going to be to invert colors in-game, which would be great. Uh, I don't see why they couldn't do it, because it's a simple Xcalibur-I-A dash dash uh, Linux command, and since uh, you know PS4 is uh, built on BSD, they could do that. Uh, they're doing uh, high contrast, on the on the UI, which is going to be nice. Uh, let's see what else they're doing. Oh yeah, larger font, bolder font, you know, just all the stuff that I've basically been asking for for years. They've just they're dumping it all into yep. one update. Uh, another interesting thing is uh, the remapping of the DualShock Four, which if you're phys if you're physically disabled, that actually might be very helpful. Yeah, to be able to move the buttons around. Uh, or presumably map them to something else uh, entirely. So, you know, it'll be that. Other devices. Yeah. But that's not the only no. change, though. This is also the update that's yeah. going to be getting uh, suspend resume. And that's where that's kind of in my wheelhouse. <laughs> uh, PSP, um, PS Vita, I've been using the hell out of that since mm -hmm. they launched. Uh, 3DS. Uh, suspend is something that every. Th that all gaming needs. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's really nice on the I Xbox can understand One why it's taken it so long to <laughs> Yeah. Um I'm not surprised that it's taken this long to get it on, you know, consoles proper, but 
I am very happy that it's arriving. Yeah. About time. It was one of the features that Sony did tout at uh, before the PS4 launch, and it's taken them yeah. like nearly a year and a half to get to it. So they must have run into issues that uh, were very difficult to solve. Apparently. I'd l- and I'd love to see a developer blog about that. Yeah. Just... It's one of those things that really interests me um, from a pure curiosity standpoint. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, nice new firmware. Should be out. So, we don't know, but usually these uh, announcements don't come too far before the actual release, so probably a couple of weeks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is a bigger update than we're used to seeing from... Uh, from firmware updates in general, we usually you just get the nondescript stability enhancements. Yeah. And so, this is definitely not that. Yeah, this is definitely a major release. And it didn't take long for us to find out what Sega and Game Freak are doing. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of things um, that I thought that that announcement could have been. Uh, Tembo the Badass Elephant was not one of them. It looks great, though. It, looks, it, it does look awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I this, it's just... I, mean, I mean, it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a, a very well-armed elephant just charging through and charging through everywhere, kicking ass, blowing things up. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I might say metal. Straight up 2D an platformer. It's a real throwback, and yeah, and I... But I would say that with um, the idea that the elephant is the metal slug and not just one of the pilots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, at least that's the way it looks. Yeah. Um, there's a trailer out there. Um, and were the platforms announced for this? I I look forward to this. Mm, I do too. What? Were the platforms announced for this? PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. Okay. So, um... Yeah, we're getting out of the console business. No mobile. Uh, except we're not. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're just lending uh, personnel to Game Freak or to whoever wants to work with them. Mm, or maybe this was something that they but, uh, had like in the we pipeline said, already. Mm. Could be. Mm. I mean, it It already looks like it's been, been cooking for some time. Yeah. And I'm not seeing anything about a, a release date on it, but... Mm. Oh, this summer. So yeah, it's probably been in the works for a while, and they're just Pretty they're going through and announcing everything that um, that they've been working on up to this point that really isn't affected by uh, no the console abandonment. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So that's a nice little surprise. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully it comes out good, and hopefully it has a future, because it, it looks bananas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when Sega does weird, they do weird. Yeah. yeah. Right. And Sega weird is good weird. Yeah. Mm. So back to Sony, and I freely admit I really didn't structure these notes very well. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, th- this is kind of our story of the week. Yeah. Um, a guy had his PSN account hacked, was defrauded of about $600 worth of DLC, and went through hell with um, with Sony customer support. Um, basically, they were willing to uh, refund him $150, but only in PSN credit, mm-hmm. because that's the most that your account can have in your wallet at any given time. Yeah. Um, Leaving him effectively SOL for six hundred dollars, and um, they straight up told him if he went to the bank, they would ban his account. Yeah. So, um, what that would basically mean, uh, getting your account banned, is that would it would effectively fuck him out of anything that he's bought on PSN with that account since the service launched yep. back in two thousand five. Um. It's one of those things that really gives you pause and makes you wonder, you know, how excited are we about our digital future <laughs> if this sort of thing is... I mean, this is the kind of nightmare scenario that people who are not so big on digital download um, kind of use as examples. I, um, yeah. The thought of buying 
a, a massive quantity of of digital content over a, a matter of years, a span of years, and then just the threat of having that taken away from you in one fell swoop. Um, it's been resolved, but it does beg a lot of questions. Yeah. Nope. This is kind of bad stewardship on Sony's part here. Uh, it doesn't matter yeah. digital or physical or whatever. This is just basic customer service. Uh, yeah, you have to deal with fraud, and you, and you can't just you know pass it off uh, on the user saying saying uh, yeah we don't really care you know that's you should have had to use the better password whatever you know you got to take care of your users you you do that you're going to make more money overall. Yes. If you if your users have no, confidence definitely. in the service and knowing that uh, you're going to take care of them if something does go wrong, they're going to be more likely to want to spend more money with you. Yep. And um, apparently this was resolved when um, I I don't know if it was a Sony rep or someone who's just had um, experience working with Sony customer service in the past. Mm-hmm recommended a very specific uh, representative to talk to, and the whole thing did get sorted out. Hmm. Uh, whether this is a question of there only being one representative there who knows how to do their job or um, just one there that with the authority to actually fix this whole thing yeah. uh, remains to be seen. I've had my own nightmare scenarios with... Um, Sony support as much as I, as much as I love the PlayStation brand and pretty much swear by it on a gaming level. Um, I am no fan of Sony uh, customer support. Uh, but yeah. sounds like it's been resolved, and hopefully this whole situation goes viral enough that they overhaul their entire program because, um, just the the fact that this is something that can happen is unacceptable. Yeah. Now, and is... another thing I should note hmm? is that two-step verification has been finally talked about. There's no there's no good reason why PSN doesn't have this already. Yeah. But there's two-step verification that's being talked about on the PlayStation blog. I've linked to it on my on the Tumblr already and it'll be in the show notes. Um we need to get over there and upvote the shit out of that <laughs> because this is something that Sony can no longer afford to to pass off as an optional feature, they need to implement this. Yeah, especially since uh, recently Shu was uh, talking about how uh, PSN is basically being attacked every day. Yeah, you gotta fix. I'm this. sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure the same goes for Xbox Live, but they've got the um, this little thing called network security that takes care of that. And I would hope by now that's something Sony knows a little more about. Yeah. But I mean, Xbox Live has uh, has two step also. So. Yeah, well, it's just built into the Microsoft account. Steam has two step. Yep. You know, it should be an industry standard. Yeah. And Sony are kind of the stragglers here, and hopefully. And Nintendo. Uh, but we won't go into. Well, Nintendo's nobody's attacking. <laughs> Nintendo network will work. Hmm. And and that's kind of one of the features of. Um, that's one of the features of Nintendo Network not having account-based purchases. <laughs> is that, you know yeah, it, you can't do crap with them. <laughs> I'm sure it's not, you're not going to steal anything. I mean, yeah. everything's tied to the system, so the only way to to steal your digital content is to steal the console. But <laughs> yeah. that's not a way to. That's not the solution to the problem either. No, <laughs> and it presents even more problems than. Then it solves. Yeah, because then when you but, um, when you call them up to migrate to another console, the poor support rep looks at all the purchases that he has to transfer manually and wants to cry. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I've had that experience. I mean, um, when I got my Wii U, <laughs> I, I was on the phone with Nintendo Tech Support, and the guy just like, "Oh yeah, I can definitely see why you want to get this whole thing cleared." Wow. <laughs> Okay. And they did have to do it every item, game by game, by hand. Yeah. And this was back when I was Mr. Complete Set of Virtual Console Games. <laughs> yeah. So shout outs to Nintendo customer support though for even doing that for me. I appreciate it yeah. to this day. But um 
Yeah, two-step verification. Um, it's talked about on the PS blog. Upvote the shit out of that because this is no longer an optional thing. Yeah. Yeah, we need some this form of it. something that Sony yeah. has to get on. Yep. Hmm. <sighs> Meanwhile, <laughs> <laughs> um, Valve, which does have um, two-step, still gets an F rating from the Bit Better Business Bureau. They aren't thrilled about that, but it's kind of hard to be surprised by it. Yeah. Um, their customer service at this point is kind of email us and we'll get to it when we can. I I have a friend myself who had his account compromised and just had to wait for them to um, to get around to him. There was yeah. no phone number to call. There was no there was no other way to get hold of him. He just put in his ticket and you know they got to him and his account was utterly unusable until then. Yeah, which was especially bad because he had pre orders and things of that nature. That he couldn't do anything with. Yeah, you got to imagine yeah. that you know Valve and well Gabe specifically is probably going to be looking at the at this sort of thing and either hiring more folks or doing something to improve the customer support situation because it is kind of bad. <laughs> it, it yeah, really they is. they say they're going to be com- they're going to be completely overhauling their customer service program this year, yeah. and this goes back to something that happened a couple months ago where um, Gabe was seeing people complaining about Steam uh, customer service on Twitter, Mm. realized that the CSQ wasn't even really getting handled in any timely manner to speak of, and attacked a whole bunch of it himself, like, firsthand. Yeah. Which is, you know, good guy Gabe, no surprise there, um, handling customer service... uh, firsthand when he sees people um, talking about issues on on Twitter, on social media. Yeah. But it shouldn't really get he's that just bad. one person and yeah. yeah, it shouldn't be falling on him to um, to keep the whole thing afloat. So hopefully something comes out of this this overhaul and we start getting news about that yeah. in the coming weeks because um as good as it is that he handled it the way he did, it would be bad if he remained their entire customer service department. Yeah. Which is pretty much what he made it look like. Yeah. Yeah, I think things are probably a little bit lax at uh, Valve. They might, Gabe might have to uh, tighten the reins a little bit. Well, that seems to be happening. Yeah. So between the F rating from the Better Business Bureau and his impromptu first-hand look at just how bad things are yeah. is going to is going to galvanize some change mm-hmm. and not a moment too soon. Yeah. And so um wrap things up, we're gonna stay on this kind of topic for our question of the week. Um will it take a constant threat of viral exposition to fix customer support in gaming? And by that I mean do we need a a site with the the size and scope of a Reddit or a YouTube or a you know Twitter that's geared toward customer service um, reviews that ju- is just so ingrained into the internet that if you have bad customer service if you're um, if somebody has a bad experience there is no way the world is going to hear about it do we need that. No, yeah, we've kind to of fix already got that. I mean, we got the consumerist, we got customer support, like we're seeing from Sony, like we're seeing from Valve. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I wouldn't really call that viral, though. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, the Sony story in particular got around to a degree that we're not used to seeing. Um, Valve came close to it, and and so that's that's kind of the the degree I'm talking about is if. Like wondering if it has to, it, if it takes a constant threat of things going to that level in uh, the online consciousness, if you will, hmm. um, in order to actually fix things to to get it where um, something like this one guy's experience with Sony cannot possibly happen because Sony knows what would happen uh, just they would know that it would end up being a situation that everyone in the world knows about 
and that is unacceptable to them. Hmm. But uh, of course, there are, there are other risks that would be associated with that. But um, you know, you don't want to have your you don't want to have a customer service support or a customer service department that on the on the ground level is scared to do anything one way or the other for fear of um, for fear of it ending up on Reddit or or whatever site, um, but yeah, I mean clearly something has to happen. I'm just not sure if this is the question of the week is basically discussing whether it um, it's going to take something that nuclear, uh, for lack of a better word, <laughs> in order to to fix the situation. Yeah. Well, I mean the fact that we do have Reddit and YouTube, you know, that's it's not like there's a constant. It's not like the threat is looming. The threat is always there for for these yeah. companies now. It, it's this is a reality. Uh, people can yeah uh, post their post their comments and they can get traction. So yeah, you know, this is something. This is a structural thing and a policy thing that companies really need to take into consideration. And you know if yeah. it if it leads to better customer support for everybody, well, you know, so much the better. Yeah, uh, at the very least, hopefully this leads to a movement where everybody records their phone calls with customer service. <laughs> yeah, I honestly, I honestly wish I had done that with an experience I had last spring with um, with Sony support, um, basically sticking me to the tune of nearly a hundred dollars that I didn't have at the time. <laughs> um, hmm. It wasn't fraud. It was just stupid. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just starting to wonder if this is going to create a groundswell of people um, being a lot more vigilant about preserving their CS experiences and having them ready to stick online and hmm. really hold the companies to account. Yeah. And... Um, if that's what it's going to take, yeah. maybe we're watching the answer play out right in front of us. <laughs> yeah, I think we are. It's, it's always a couple of outlier companies. You know, most of the most of the companies in gaming actually get this. But yeah, there's a couple that uh, haven't quite figured it out yet. Yeah, and, and but you you think of who those outliers are: hmm. Sony, Valve. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. Not companies usually associate with the word outlier. <laughs> yeah. But, um, well, but those... hopefully the squeaky wheel gets the grease. People, yeah. or, or Sony definitely knows that people know uh, what went on with this guy who got defrauded of $600 now. So we'll, we'll see what plays out from this because uh, the internet isn't going to shut up about it now. No. Nope. So. I think that's a show. It is. It's nice to just do an, uh, a simple, relaxed, um, you know, no trade shows going on kind of episode. Yeah. It wasn't a crazy week or anything. It was just, it's just a show. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. And with that, I'm Felipe Donaldo. I'm Patrick Mifflin. Update complete.